Welcome. Welcome to Community of Christ with the Shenandoah Congregation in San Antonio, Texas. Community of Christ is a welcoming and loving faith community. We proclaim Jesus Christ and promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. Please take a moment and like our video, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss anything, and comment to tell us where you are joining us from. Keep our contact details and share with us how we can minister to your needs. Find more information at www.cofchristsa.org. If you would like to view past services, follow this link on our website. We welcome you, we acknowledge you, and we love you. Shalom. Our gathering hymn this morning is This Is My Song. It's sang in Spanish and French and English. And if you prefer singing it in English, please turn to 389 in our hymnal and remain seated, please.
I welcome you to worship with the uh, Shenandoah Congregation of the Community of Christ. And happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. What makes a dad? God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities. When there was nothing more to add, he, he knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. <clears throat> Kelly Patton and Ruth uh, Collier will join me with the call to worship. The kingdom of God is that kind of kingdom where we will all be welcome and all have a place. The kingdom of God is for the poor and the rich, the needy and the powerful, the marginalized and the mighty. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom that conquers with wars or politics. Jesus taught us that the kingdom of God conquers the sinner with love. The kingdom of God is like a planted seed that sprouts and grows up to be what God intended. Thank you, ladies. Please stand for our praise hymn, Praise to the Living God, number eight, and remain standing for the invocation. to be a part of your community worshiping together and sell in us your ways of peace and love us as we follow your son may your spirit be with us in his name we ask amen please be seated Marilyn McCrimmon will lead us in the peace prayer
please all center your attention to this small candle and how each of us can work with the Lord to spread his peace. Please pray with me. O oh, Holy One, Almighty God, hear us in this day of conflict and trouble. Give us sanctuary to sustain us on bad days as we trust in your promises. Accept our offerings of peace and help us to trust more in you than in our own resources, agendas, or desires. Allow us to remember your name and greatness in our own weaknesses. Give us strength to work for justice and the coming of your kingdom. God, hear our prayer and grant us your peace. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. We'll remain seated for our congregational hymn, Leftover People and Leftover Places, number 275. And after that, our pastor Earl Anderson will bring us the message for the morning.
the kingdom is like. Oh, okay, fill in the blank. No, just kidding. But that's the theme for the day. The king, the, the kingdom of is like. So, uh, I'm sure we've all wondered what the kingdom is like. Uh, and the scriptures give us a glimpse of that. But how does this kingdom of, you know, what it's like, how does it all start? Well, Jesus gave us several parables. And in, and it, it's in Matthew and in Mark, but I'm going to, I'm citing Mark chapter four. And there's really two parables specific that I want to talk, talk about that come out of Mark 4. And I will also talk about one other that comes out of Mark 13. From Mark 26 to 29 tells us, and that's chapter 4. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grains ripen immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So, What's the farmer's part in this? To plant the seed. That's, you know, I don't know if any of you ever been a farmer. In the nowadays, it's not hard to plant a seed because they just open up these bins on this big part of the back end of the tractor and put the seed in there and drive down and it plants it. But back in Jesus's time, each seed was individually planted. So, the farmer's part is to plant the seed. And then it grows by night. It sprouts in the morning. So our part or the farmer's part is that we are a partner with God. We plant the seed and God does the rest. This kind of reminds me of what Jesus told the disciples. You know, go out and expose people to the word, right? And he says, uh, once you've done that, because you can't make people do things, you, but you can't expose them. Jesus tells them what? Uh, after that, it's up to me. It's in my it's up to me. I will take it from there. So farmer plants the seed. By night, it grows. In the morning, it sprouted. And now we are a partner with God. Man has done all he can do. The, all the rest is up to God. There's nothing we can do. The rest is up to God. So how does this translate? There are things that happen that we really don't know what's going on. It's a mystery to us. Yes, we plant the seed, but then it grows. That part is a mystery. God is in control of that. What is the seed referencing in this parable? The, the seed is repre representing or referencing the word of God. His disciples had a hard time, you know, getting, getting this. And I know it frustrated Jesus. And I'll, I'll read a little verse here that will uh, kind of bring that to light. But it's, it's God does the stuff that's invisible to us. 
the word, which is the seed, once it becomes into our life, it, be, it starts working invisibly in our life. That's why it's so important to read the scriptures. If we don't know the scriptures, it's a little difficult for the word of God to work in our life. But that's what that's referencing. God, this comes out of Isaiah 55, 11, says, God promised that his word would accomplish the purpose for which he sends it. God sends us the word. We all have access to the word. And it will serve its purpose in our life. Whether we realize it or not. Because we've been exposed to the word. There's power in the word. When we read the word, the seed, even when we're sleeping, guess what? It is working within us. It, it, impacts the things that we dream it impacts how we see things in the morning it's like oh i think i understand something i didn't understand before that's the power of the word what is in re reference to the word what are we commissioned to do? That's rhetorical. But I think you know the answer. We're called to go out and sow the seed. Sow the word. Once we've done that, then it's in God's head. And when I reference God, I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. It's in God's hand. Invisible to the eye, but works constantly in our life. It, it just does this spontaneously. But we have to, you know, I, I think back in the day uh, when the foundation was laid under me. And many of us probably have similar experiences where the foundation was laid under us by our parents, maybe one or both parents. And how that foundation, even though we didn't realize it at the time, began to grow within us. I know with me, it definitely grew. <laughs> it grew with me. You know, back in those days, I don't know about y'all, but uh, I went to church whether I had wanted to or not. Mom didn't give me a choice. I didn't think it was such a good thing she was doing at the time. And I have to say mom, because my dad didn't do that. But my mom did. But that foundation she laid under me, within me, by exposing me to the word, later on began to develop in my life, whether I knew it or not. In other words, I began to morph, change. Recognize things I wouldn't have recognized before. The world became less important and Christ became more important. So my mother planted the seed and that's what we are called to do. That's what we are called to do.
Jesus said, and I'm here, I'm going to reference uh, another uh, of the parables that's in Mark 4. This comes out of Mark 4, 13, and it's the parable of the soils. And this is where the farmer sows the seeds, right? Remember, we're talking, he scatters the seeds, and it talks about, you know, what if, you know, he, he throws the seeds uh, on a path, you know, hard path. What happens? Well, basically what happens is these birds and birds come along and do what? Eat up the seed. Or if the seed is the word, then who are those birds? The world, Satan's minions, the the emissary, the, 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 the bad ones, right? They influence us because there's not even a way to get any kind of root going. And then it goes on to say, you know, sown on, on rocky soil. But, you know, at first when it's sown on rocky soil, there's little bitty shoots of roots coming out, right? But those roots can't take hold. There's joy in the beginning, but those roots can't take hold. And then the world comes involved, and what happens? They quickly diminish. And trust me, Satan will take every advantage of that that he can. And then it goes on to say, well, what if the, uh, the seeds are thrown in a batch of, of thorns, right? Worries of life deceitfulness of wealth, earthly desires. What happens when those thorns are involved? What happens when the world takes over us versus and changes our focus on the world versus Christ? It gets choked. The word is choked out. So the seed he speaks of represents the word of God. With this parable, Jesus shows the way the word of God works with hidden and mysterious power. Just like the seed. Now you have to remember the Bible isn't uh, an instructional it isn't just an instructional manual. It is an instructional manual, but it's not just an instructional manual. And it isn't just a list of rules, the things we should and should not do in our life. The Bible, the word, lives and works its life in us. It works its life within us. The idea that a preacher lends life to the word of, you know, God's word, in my opinion, is wrong. Those who speak the word only lend the voice to communicate the word. That's what we do. That's when we, as individuals, when we go out and talk to others and expose them to the word, we are lending our voice to make that happen. The voice is what we use. If you ever want to convert somebody to Christ, don't do this. Don't take your Bible and say, read. You know, you know what? I'm not going to, I don't believe in absolutes. But I can, I would really willing to guess nine out of 10 times, you know what's going to happen? Nope. Try to get those arms unfolded. You want to turn somebody off? Force that Bible down their throat. Plus, I am also a firm believer that if they can't see the word within us as it in our lives, they're not going to listen to us anyway. It's more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning and putting our church face on. 
More importantly, it's what we do when we leave the doors and they see us during the rest of the week. And if that doesn't come in line with what we're espousing or trying to expose them to, we've lost them. Our credibility and what we were trying to deliver has been diminished because if they don't see what we're saying should be in their life and they can't see it in our life, it's like children. You, parents, and I'm guilty, the parents say, you got to do this. And the child's, you know, they hear every word you say. They're not listening to what you're saying, but they hear everything that you're saying. Because what they end up doing later, the parent comes back and says, why are you doing this? Then I tell you, why are you doing this? The child comes back and says, I just do what you do. Tell me I'm wrong. That's okay. I can handle it. But I think we've all been there. It's no different than it, the ways that we go about exposing the word. People have to see it in our lives. They have to see it in our lives. Like a seed, the word of God has a hidden and mysterious power. And I, I believe that with all my heart. Mysterious power. If we internalize the word in our lives, it's amazing how people will see us. There's a difference between being a Christian here. Saying a Christian isn't going to cut it. It's saying a Christian that's in congruence or reflected in our actions. It's like repenting. You know, you hear people say, "Oh, well, I'm sorry, Lord. No, but sorry. And then you turn it right around. We turn it right around and go on and do what we, we did that we said we're sorry for. But if we repent, repentance requires an action. Therefore, when we repent, people see us and they should see the word of what repentance is all about reflected in what they see of us now. That has meaning. That is what converts people. Not shoving the Bible down their throat. It does just the opposite. Satan wants us to try to shove it down their throat because he knows what the out, he's a smart being. Not a human being, but he's a strong, God created him, but he's very smart. And you know, Satan can't make us do anything. But he can sure plant those ideas. And if we fall for those ideas that he plants in our mind on how we should go after things instead of doing it like Christ wants us to do that he achieves his result because Satan's only, only thing he's after, he knows he's not going to defeat God. All he's after and is trying to hurt as many of the people that God loves as he possibly can and turn their attention away from the only one person that can bring us salvation. And that's Christ, his son. Because remember, only through him can we get to the Father? That's why he died on the cross. So he could take on our sins because we cannot go to the Father unless we are sinless. But it says Christ took on our sins. Then through him, we can go to the Father because of what Christ did for us. Boy, God must, the Father must really love us to, to put his son through what he did. 
And the son must really love us to take on all that stuff that, that we're sin loaded with and take it on when he's sinless to begin with. But it's all part of God's plan. It's all part of God's plan. The seed is very important. The mustard seed is at the time of Jesus was the smallest seed at the time of Jesus. There are other seeds that are smaller, if you can believe it or not, than a mustard seed. But in the time of Jesus, in that location, the mustard seed was the smallest seed. And from that mustard seed, it grows into this big bush. Anywhere It could grow anywhere from 10 to 15 feet. Do you know that the seed is so small that it takes 15,000 seeds, mustard seeds, to equal one ounce? That's a little seed. And there ain't much weight to it. One ounce, 15,000 mustard seeds. So something so small can create something so large. Now think about the disciples. What, in the scheme of things, the disciples were what? The mustard seed. And from those few disciples, the 12 apostles, well, 11 and then plus one, because we know what happened to Judas. But from that, very insignificant number, what started from it, it began to grow. Small beginning, over time, the, the kingdom, the kingdom of God begins to grow on this earth from a small beginning. And who planted those seeds and those apostles? Jesus did. Pretty good, pretty good sower. Yes, me. Pretty incredible. And as and you think about it, those Christians were try they the Romans and others tried to eradicate the Christians. But guess what they can never do? They couldn't do it. That seed just kept growing over time to where we are today. To where we are today. You know, what's the character of Jesus? <laughs> it was prophetically said of him, a bruised reed he will not break and smoking flack he will not quench. And that comes out of Isaiah 42, 3. Now, if you read that on the surface, what does that really mean? Well, I'll help you. The reed is a very fragile plant. And if it's bruised, the servant will handle it very gently. He will not break it. The flax, is, the flax is used as a kinder to start a fire in, in Jesus' time. Does not flame, but only smokes. But the servant will not put it out. He will not put it out. What the servant does, and this is what Christ did, he will gently blow on the smoking flax. Until what? The flame takes over. You ever see when you start a fire, you know, particularly for you all at camp and so on and so forth, and you're putting the kindling in there and it starts smoking. What do we do? Do we not? We don't get a bottle of water uh, they ain't going to like and throw it on it, do we? You know, way, that's, that's what we should do too. You know, if you think about it, when do we expose the word to people? You know, and don't get defensive. I mean, people, stay away from the defensiveness. We have nothing to be defensive of. 
We're just called to share. And then sometimes it's, it's good to know when to what? Step back. And then later on, you come back and you just a little bit more. And in small dose, doses, the first thing you know, you see this person and what do you see? Flames. In other words, they have come alive in Christ. It works. I'm telling you, it works. I've had people in my life uh, who have approached me and in, in my work environment. And they'll say, gosh, there's something different about you. Once somebody ever, if they can see the word in you, the word manifestate, manis I can't even say that word, come into life in you, okay? If they can see that, I've had them come up to me and say, there's something different about you. What is it? Once they ask that question, they're open to what you have to say. And don't be afraid to communicate. Don't be afraid to communicate it. And once you communicate it, and I, 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 I've been chastised for this, but it doesn't matter. It's, the importance isn't to bring them to a particular church. The importance is to bring them to Christ. People say, why didn't you bring them to church? Well, they, they're in church. They're worshiping where they believe they can worship Christ. That's that, not, don't get me wrong. I'd love to bring them here. But sometimes that's successful. Sometimes what's more important is they find and they went from never going to church to involved in like my Christian, like mind Christians in their belief in Christ. Starts as that, you know, people are like reeves. They're very fragile. And if we break them, they're never gonna, they, I ain't gonna say never. I don't believe in absolutes. But the likelihood of them coming to Christ may take a long time may take a long time. I believe the Bible is the best psychology book ever written in dealing with people. And uh, I have ventured personally and uh, put trying to put the practice things at the Bible. And I have found pretty much without exception that this stuff does work. Christ is pretty smart. The things that were reported by the gospel writers, by Paul, so on. Uh, I'm I am so glad, and not, it's not just the New Testament, but there are there are people out there say why bother with the Old Testament? You know that was well if if that wasn't important, then why did Christ reference it so much? You know. He did. He referenced it a lot. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets give us clues on how and things that we should learn from. Some people regard, well, let me read the mustard seed verse real quick. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with that, what parable? shall we picture it it is like a mustard seed which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than the seeds of the earth uh, you know on earth but when it is sown it grows up becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade and many uh and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they heard it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained. You see, 
the, the disciples could not get it. He, they just had a hard time getting these parables. So after he would tell the people the parables, he would take them aside and try to explain. So it, it talks about the birds that grow up under, take refuge under the mustard seed, right? What are those birds? I mean, people just think, oh, they're birds, you know, like great shade, you know? The birds are more significant than that. The birds represent that all are welcome in the kingdom of God. And those birds, if you, if you ever sat on your back porch, are all the birds the same? No, that's absolutely right. Kathleen, I, I like your non -verbals. You know, I, I love Kathleen. I can always tell if I'm on track or not, you know? <laughs> Richard, I don't know how you do it, buddy. No. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. But the birds are significant because just like the birds on our, when we're outside looking in the trees and so on, they're not the same. The Bible only referenced two peoples, Jews and Gentiles. Does, and the Jews are Jews, but the Gentiles are all kinds of different birds. But the bottom line is, God looks down and he just sees us as Gentiles. Too bad people can't think that way. If they could, we wouldn't have all these divisions. But that's true. You can look, read through the Bible if you find any description other than Jew or Gentile. Let me know. But then there's other birds. You know, if you ever sat on your back porch and you got all these little birds and the robins and the red birds and so on, and then you hear this big squawk come in and it's blue bird. It's not a blue bird, but it's a blue a bird with a blue collar with a little white in the chest, blue jay. And what do those blue jays do? Scatter the other birds. Well, you can tell who I'm referencing here from the blue jays. I'm not saying they are, but the analogy is, is that they scatter the ones who have come to worship in this garden setting and scatter them. Sounds a lot like what Satan does, doesn't it? The greater the kingdom grows here on earth gives more opportunity for Satan to get involved and try to work on those other birds. And some birds will fall away. They won't come back. I have birds in my backyard that won't come back because that blue jay, or more than one, hang around. Other birds, hey, I'm a believer. There's food in there, and I want it. Put that in a people perspective. I'm a believer in the word. I, no matter what you do, I am not. But that's not true for everybody. If it was true, if it was, there wouldn't be a narrow path and a wide path. Let me say it that way. You know, the scriptures talk about a narrow path and a wide path. There wouldn't be a wide path. But, you know, we're the ones that like the food. So we're on that narrow path. But not, unfortunately, not everybody is destined due to their own cause or decisions they make in their life for that. So... Remember that size in churches doesn't indicate uh, that people are necessarily following Christ in those churches. Many are. 
But as the kingdom gets bigger, there are those who are either doubters or are there to influence the ones. And these same people will call themselves Christians. But when Christ comes one day in the cloud, he looks out through our mind and hearts, we're told in Thessalonians. You think we can kid him? No, because he knows what's here. I may, there are going to be a lot of people who say, I'm a Christian, and they're going to be disappointed. That's sad. But it's true. We can't control other people, but guess who we have control over? Ourselves. It's our decisions. It's a personal decision. Do we follow Christ or do we give lift service to Christ? Christ from a very small seed has planted Christians all over the world. And you know, he's not gonna give up until as many of them come as absolutely possible. So there's a lot of meaning behind these parables. They're just not about planting a seed. Oh, he grows big. Birds gather under him. There's a lot that goes with those parables. And you know, the disciples got it, but it took Christ having to ascend so the Father could bring the Holy Spirit to fall upon them. And then all of a sudden, they got it. But we have something they don't. We have their writings that help us exp help explain that to us. That's the importance of the word. God bless you all. And uh, I hope you all have a very good Father's Day out there, Father. Now, Lila Gardner will lead us in the disciples' generous response. Good morning. Our scripture reading for the disciples' generous response today comes from Doctrine and Covenants 147, 5a. Stewardship is the response of my people to the ministry of my son, and is required alike of all who seek to build the kingdom. Spiritual authorities are urged to teach with renewed vigor in recognition of the great need and let nothing separate them from those who have more specific responsibilities in the temporal affairs of the church. The disciples' generous response is a time when we focus our hearts and our minds on God. We try to align our hearts with God's heart. We can tangibly express our gratitude to God, the giver of all, through our offerings. But I want to take just a moment today to remind us that there's more to stewardship than our offerings or our treasure. There's something that we all have that there is absolutely no discrimination on, and that is time. We all have have 24 hours every day given to us. I don't know of anybody that has more than 24 hours or anybody that has less than 24 hours. The last time I checked, we all get the same amount of time every day. That's one of the few things that there can be no discrimination about. You know, there are a lot of lots of things that are not equal in our world today. But time is something that we all have the same amount every day. 
And time is an important part of stewardship. So as you think about stewardship, remember that the way that you choose to use your time also expresses your stewardship. But there's another thing that we need to remember too, and that's about talents. It always troubles me when somebody says, oh, I don't have any talents. So-and-so has lots of talents, but I don't have any. God does not make junk. <laughs> he has given each of us talents. It is our responsibility to discover what those talents are and to nurture them and develop them and then use them in building the kingdom of God. I'll get off my soapbox. But remember, all three are important, not just our treasure. Our time, our talent, and our treasure are all important in stewardship. Will the ushers please come forward? Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer our thanks for the blessings that you give us each and every day. We gratefully receive those blessings and we hopefully, gratefully reflect those blessings by doing what we need to do to bring about your kingdom on this earth so that we will faithfully respond by living your mission on earth. Lord, we join in making your work visible in the world through our stewardship. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, Brothers and Sisters of Mine, number 616, and remain standing for the benediction.
we thank you, God, for this time of worship and your presence among us. Guide us in the ways we can witness to others of your redemptive presence in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You can unmute now and join in fellowship. <laughs>